So um, I will speak about uh, next uh, generation, which is now more and more coming into our routine clinic, uh, especially in those uh, institutions that are doing genetic analysis. My presentation will be on next generation sequencing technologies, uh, but I also would like to give a perspective of next generation sequencing for assessing data on genetics in inhibitor formation and bleeding phenotype. Um, I will shortly address the perspectives of next generation sequencing in monogenetic bleeding disorders. Until recently, we believed that uh, with the Sanger sequencing in a monogenetic, well phenotyped uh, disorder, we are doing it perfectly. But next generation is offering us uh, a broader spectrum. And uh, um, I will point to one recent publication where the perspectives of next generation sequencing in complex platelet disorders are shown in this present. This issue will then be much more in detail addressed in the next uh, presentation of this session. So we have a number of milestones in the genetic analysis in hemophilia A. In the 80s, carrier diagnosis or genetic analysis was driven by carrier diagnosis. Why, since the beginning of the 90s, genetic analysis in hemophilia is driven by the phenotype of the patient, especially the inhibitor formation. The coding sequence of factor VIII was discovered in 1984. Uh, then the area of um, RFLP analysis was coming. Uh, in the beginning of the 90s, we had uh, screening techniques uh, to localize the mutation that then was sequenced in more detail. For the factor VIII gene, we had the intron 22, the intron 1 inversions. Uh, more recently, then duplications were available to detect by the technology of uh, multi-linkage probe analysis. And now, very recently, next generation is applied also to hemophilia for deep intronic uh, mutations. And by these technologies, almost all mutations nowadays in hemophilia patients can be identified. The milestones of next generation sequencing are the first published sequence in 1973, then uh, the development of PCR that was, uh, um, that was uh, the basis of uh, analyzing and uh, sequencing DNA fragments in 1983. Uh, we had the capillary sequencers introduced in the mid-90s and they became our working machines for the routine sequencing. And uh, with these capillary sequencers that were based on the Sanger sequencing method, uh, sequencing of uh, whole genomes uh, like uh, Elegans or the human genome in 2000 uh, were, uh, were achieved. About 10 years ago, the next generation sequencing systems were introduced and now we are even at the time of third generation sequencing uh, systems. Um, also, we have these next generation sequences around us for more than 10 years. Um, only very recently they are really uh, in, introduced into a routine diagnostic setting. So what are the main technologies of next generation sequencing? Um, all these bases, all these technologies have a similar overall basis. Uh, they have a library preparation of single-stranded DNA fragments. Then uh, these fragments are put on a surface, and then there is a clonally amplification of uh, uh, single DNA fragments a uh, million times. These uh, fragments then are sequenced, and uh, nowadays a bioinformatic tool is needed to put and align all these sequences. It's no longer that we have a continuous sequence that we can read through. 
but uh, we need now bioinformatic tools that are putting uh, together these sequences. The main uh, next generation sequencing technologies are the system from Roche 454, then uh, the LifeTech solid technology, um, the LifeTech ion torrent technology, and um, all these um, technologies are working by clonal amplification. Um, there are different technologies to uh, to, to get single strands and uh, different surfaces that are used. Um, then the reaction output is measured by luminescence or fluorescence, pH change um, technologies. The signal then is converted into a sequence. So all these technologies, they differ in design and chemistry. The sequencing of thousands to millions of clonally amplified molecules uh, is done in parallel. We have now order of magnitudes more information and this will continually increase with the new technologies. It's uh, attractive also for clinical applications as I will show later to go from a gene by gene analysis uh, to the analysis of multiple genes in parallel and selective readouts of those genes. This is uh, one technology where uh, double-stranded genomic DNA is singleified. Uh, then it's uh, put into an emulsion PCR and on the surface of beads, a single DNA strand then is clonally amplified a thousand times. Uh, these beads are then uh, put into uh, analysis structure that allows uh, sequencing on a very, very large scale. And all this information then is uh, put together in a bioinformatic system. This is a Illumina sequencing platform where, again, we have single-stranded uh, DNA that is attached to a surface, an array, uh, by specific adapters. These adapters are separating the single strands, and then uh, by a second adapter, the single strand is building a bridge, and then could be clonally amplified, and the readout is achieved by a laser system. Another technology is this solid color coding technology, uh, which again is using beads for clonally amplification of the DNA strands. Then the technology is applied that is coding uh, denucleotides by certain colors, and the sequence of these colors then can be read out and translated into a DNA sequence. These uh, methods, which uh, still are quite costly, although uh, for routine applications, the systems have now become much cheaper in the order of $50,000 to $100,000. Uh, um, and also the analysis that was uh, quite expensive in the past has now become way achievable. And with respect to cost in an intelligent setting, this next generation sequencing technology can compete with uh, Zanger sequencing. And for many, many uh, research questions or diagnostic purpose questions, it's even much, much cheaper than the Zanger sequencing. The reads, so the DNA fragments, um, are way, way different from way short lengths of about 10 to 15 base pairs to 200 base pairs. And if you have a, a whole coverage of a gene several hundred times, you can imagine that uh, there should be a very intelligent software behind this that is putting the sequence together in the right order. So I would like to address the perspective of next generation sequencing for assessing data and hemophilia on genetics in inhibitor formation, uh, which is a burden, and we know not much 
about the inhibitor formation. Uh, there are a number of genetic risk factors that we have. So we have, of course, a factor eight gene mutation that is now our leading risk uh, uh, figure, but we have ethnicity, and uh, within the ethnicity, multiple genetic risk factors um, are addressed. We have immune response genes, and every six months another immune response gene is published that contributes to the risk of inhibitor formation. But at the moment, all these data are very fragmented. We have no tools to uh, put all these data in a single patient together. Uh, we have the immune system that is acting as a cascade with many, many genes uh, that are involved. And uh, with respect to the immune response genes uh, and their polymorphism, there are only few consensus data. Usually, the data are incomplete, so we have different cohorts of patients in which different uh, genes have been analyzed. Uh, the relative risk figures of those genes are small, so each gene is contributing only very little to the risk of inhibitor formation. And uh, factors are not independent, but may share common pathways um, as in uh, the immune response cascade shown. So it's very, very difficult to build this genetic information into risk models. But it would be ideal if we could do so, because then we could determine uh, the genetic risk by, for example, next generation sequencing, and then we can individualize the risk for uh, the patients. Those that have a low risk are going to a maybe classical regimen, and those that have a high inhibitor risk may be addressed to very specific uh, regimens where we expect a lower risk of inhibitor formation. For example, a very low dose of factor VIII. Uh, there are several um, hypotheses around this. But what we need for this are very good genetic uh, um, information and risk models to build in. So the next generation sequencing potential is that we can put all risk genes that we know at a certain time point for inhibitor formation and combine them in the same amplification procedure. Now 50 to 100 genes can be analyzed in parallel and then uh, gene-specific readout uh, can be uh, performed. Uh, this technology is uh, not that expensive, about 500 euro per run. The pros are that we have a complete data of the state-of-the-art knowledge on a patient with all the genes that may contribute to the immune response. Uh, and we have the potential for building up integrated uh, risk assessment models. The cons is that we need to continuously adaptate and reanalyze re for newly identified risk genes. And um, for this, the complete human genome analysis could be an approach. Uh, uh, the costs are achievable. They are quite expensive still, but they are becoming more and more achievable. The pros is that you are getting a complete genome data on the patient, and if new risk genes are identified that contribute to inhibitor information, you just need another readout by the software. Um, you don't need a complete analysis. You don't need a separate sample. Um, you can perform genome-wide analysis, and also you have a full data set available on each patient. Only one sample of the patient is needed. The cons are ethic issues, so sequencing and storing of a patient's DNA code is um, not ethically solved. They are now, um, they are now uh, um, ways to deal with this information. Uh, and the availability of predictive gene data on a large scale also needs to be addressed. There are technologies uh, beyond 
DNA analysis that is also based on next, gener next generation sequencing. This is RNA profiling. It's a protein expression profiling and it's epigenetic profiling. Another very clinical important question is um, the perspective of uh, next generation sequencing for assessing data in hemophilia on genetics and bleeding phenotype or genetics and inflammatory response to bleeds. Some patients are much, much more um, responding to one bleed with respect to joint damage than other patients or pharmacokinetics. We know that the hemophilia phenotype is uh, composed on many genetic influence factors. It's a factor A gene mutation, but also thrombophilic mutations may play a role. Uh, mutations or variations in gene uh, of the immune response system may play a role, and all this is contributing to a hemophilia phenotype. We know that, for example, the pharmacokinetics are way, way different in patients. They can differ by 100%. And uh, as everything should have a genetic background, also the pharmacokinetics likely have a, uh, differences in these pharmacokinetics likely have a genetic background. There's a potential of next generation sequencing for large genes like the von Willebrand factor gene or complex uh, disorders in platelets. Um, and uh, I have uh, chosen three very recent publications to illustrate this potential. Uh, this is a publication from Spain, from Bastida, and they have built up an array with, uh, that allows the simultaneous analysis of 23 genes by next generation sequencing. The genes are um, indicated here. It's all um, plasma proteins that are contributing to the coagulation, factor 11, 8, 9, coagulation factors 2, 5, 7, then from the vitamin K pathway, the combined factor um, 5 and 8 deficiency genes, fibrinogen, uh, and all these genes could be analyzed in the same procedure. Uh, they have validated this system in a number of patients, and they found that next generation sequencing and uh, the classical Sanger sequencing were 100% concordant. So they concluded that next generation sequ sequencing is accurate, reproducible, and reliable in a routine laboratory diagnostic setting. This is uh, another example uh, where um, a group around uh, Fidalgo has analyzed patients with a von Willebrand disease. It's a, a Portuguese uh, study. They had um, in total 60 patients with different types of von Willebrand disease, type 1, type 2N, type 3, and various types 2. And they identified a total of 62 von Willebrand gene mutations by this technology. And next generation sequencing allowed them to identify additional mutations that were not identified by Sanger sequencing. And these additional mutations that contribute to the phenotype and the causality are shown in green color. And uh, this is another application of next generation sequencing to complex uh, disorders, as platelet disorders that will be addressed in the next uh, uh, presentation. That is extremely helpful because um, many, many genes can be analyzed at the same time um, and then the analysis uh, by bioinformatic tools uh, could identify a causal mutation. Here, three cohorts were analyzed in a recent publication in blood that were those cohorts that have a very clear phenotype. There were uh, cohorts um, with a, a expected um, 
uh, etiology, and there were cohorts where there was no suspected etiology of the disease. The next generation sequencing identified all mutations in those patients uh, with uh, uh, known um, mutations in a, in a gene. Uh, they identified the mutation in about 90% of mutations where an etiology was suspected, but uh, only in about 10% of patients where there was no suspected etiology. So, again, it's very, very important that we have a very, very good phenotyping of the patients. Uh, and in patients with uh, no suspected etiology, the uh, power of the next generation sequencing is still limited. So, uh, this group has developed a targeted sequencing platform covering 63 genes linked to uh, bleeding disorders or thrombotic disorders or platelet disorders. And they called this uh, thrombogenomics platform, which uh, provides a way sensitive test to obtain molecular diagnosis in patients with a suspected etiology. So the perspectives of next generation sequencing is that uh, it, uh, it's becoming now available for routine application with respect to technologies and also with respect to cost. It can compete with the classical Sanger sequencing. Next generation sequencing can analyze multiple genes at the same time with a gene-specific readout, a single gene in the monogenetic disorders uh, with a clear phenotype where we can analyze a number of uh, uh, those genes at the same time, or multiple genes in complex disorders. The complex condition and hemophilia are, for example, the development of inhibitor formation, the bleeding phenotype, the inflammatory response to bleeds or pharmacokinetics, and uh, we may gain more and more information like a puzzle to put the uh, pathophysiologic background of these uh, uh, differences uh, together. And platelet disorders uh, as a complex uh, bleeding phenotype um, is an ideal target for next generation sequencing. Another perspective is that next generation sequencing may facilitate more complete data assessment. Now we have uh, very fragmented data from our patients and the whole genome sequencing, once done, allows additional gene-specific readouts at any later time without additional analysis of the source material. So it's a potential to gain complete data in all patients that are analyzed. Uh, and there is an incremental increase of knowledge over time. Always when a new gene is identified, it can be easily read out of the existing sequence, but ethical issues have to be solved um, before this uh, can become reality. Thank you very much for your attendance.